Hello again, and welcome to the 10th installment to the review of Netflix Sandman. This is the final episode of this story arc, and if you are like me, you are more than happy that it will be done. Not only did the story arc start off extremely weak, with its insufferable race-swapped characters, and the showrunner's zero attention to detail and continuity, but it has consistently trended downward after each passing episode. Let us see if the trend continues. As always, if you have missed any previous installments, a playlist will be linked down below. Now with all of that said, let us begin. Episode 10. Lost Hearts. As you remember from the previous episode, Rose and Jed were cornered down a hallway by Fun Land when the Corinthian kills him. They are all in their hotel suite, and the Corinthian assures them that he is not going to hurt them, but Rose reminds him that he just killed Fun Land. The Corinthian says he just saved them from him, and that he has saved Jed once again, and he is trying to protect them from Morpheus. Rose tells the Corinthian that he is one of the missing nightmares, and he tells her that he knows Rose is the vortex. She tells him that Morpheus is watching her, and says he is not doing so to protect her, but rather keeping an eye on her, and when she is asleep, and the walls between the waking world and the dreaming break down, he will kill Rose. The Corinthian says, if he can stand in his way and protect her, she would become the center of the dreaming, and render Morpheus powerless, thus, he would be free of him. This is bullshit. That's right. It is all bullshit. The entire plan the Corinthian has in regards to saving himself from Morpheus is not source material obviously, but when you think about it, it makes no sense. Per the source material, if a dream vortex is not killed, and allowed to exist, dreams and reality will eventually be blitzed together, and the entire universe will be destroyed. What will happen to Morpheus? Nothing. He will continue to exist even though many worlds will perish. As the Lord of Dreams, it is his duty, and the task that he is trying to resolve in this story arc, and save humanity from oblivion. A previous vortex was not dealt with in a timely manner, and Morpheus did lose an entire universe because of it. With that first-hand experience, of course Morpheus knows why cracks are forming in the dreaming. Of course he knows what needs to be done in order to resolve the issues. There is no need for a condescending black woman to tell him what needs to be done, nor does he need some pointless pep talk from a disloyal bird to find the urgency to act upon it. It is all bullshit conjured up to propagate the woke narrative. Anyway, let us continue. A knock is heard at the door and the Corinthian greets the doctor. She informs him that his keynote speech is due in 10 minutes, and he lets her know that everything has been handled on his end. The Corinthian tells Rose that he is going downstairs for an hour, and asks Rose if she will wait. She says no, and she is taking Jed home. The Corinthian offers no protest, and tells her it is not safe to wander around the hotel, and if she does leave, Matthew will find them. He gives her his keycard and the option of staying in the room. When he comes back, she can let him back in or not. The Corinthian goes down to the ballroom and gives his keynote, which glorifies what they are, and we get a brief montage of some of them performing their acts. The Corinthian tells the attendees to close their eyes while he monologues, and Morpheus appears in front of him. Up in the suite, Rose and Jed fall asleep, and Rose wakes up suddenly, and tells Jed they have to go. Morpheus explains his disappointment in the Corinthian, and he tells him that he has done his best in performing his duties as he was created. Morpheus tells him he has done nothing over the past century other than pass along the joy of death. The Corinthian says, what now? Is he just going to put him back in people's dreams again, and pulls his knife out in defiance? Morpheus is unfazed and holds his hand out to uncreate him, and the Corinthian stabs his hand injuring Morpheus to his surprise, and he asks how. The Corinthian narrates he has Rose Walker, and she grows stronger while Morpheus gets weaker. Rose and Jed wander through the hotel and find that they are dreaming, and see the killers performing their tasks. The killers begin to approach Rose and Jed menacingly, and they run down the hall seeing Morpheus imploring her to wake up. The Corinthian is behind her and says he has no power, and this is all her dream. Morpheus tells Rose this is the Corinthian's dream, and not hers, and she can change it. The Corinthian says the dreaming is hers, and she can make it her own dream. Jed disappears and she asks where he is, and the Corinthian says he's fine and is sleeping right next to her. We get a back and forth with Morpheus and the Corinthian trying to convince Rose to believe them with the exposition that she will destroy both the waking world and the dreaming. Suddenly, Rose tells them to stop and tells the Corinthian if she is as powerful as he says, then she will find her own way, and brings back the barriers of dreams. Let me pause it here. This is all bullshit. None of this is even remotely accurate to the comic. However, a little black woman between two white males is the perfect time to activate, girl boss mode. 
Fucking hell. Who is in control? The black girl. Who is not in control? The white men. The white men that are immortal, belong in the dream world, and are currently in a dream. And one of them is the fucking Lord Shaper himself. The brazenness this show does to make Morpheus an impotent bitch is absolutely atrocious. The lord of his realm that he created, is completely powerless within his own realm. How fucking stupid is that? So let us look at a vortex. A swirling mass that brings everything around it towards the center. And what happens when things converge in the center? They are destroyed, like a whirlpool or a tornado does. So if the vortex affects the dreaming, and the waking world, and the Corinthian wants to remain in the waking world, how does this benefit him? That's right. It doesn't, because the Corinthian has nothing to do with Rose Walker being a vortex. As a vortex, Morpheus allowed her to bring Fiddler's Green and the Corinthian together to find them both. Once again, it cannot get any worse than this, can it? Anyway, Rose ends the dream and wakes up remembering everything. The Corinthian and Morpheus are back in the ballroom. The Corinthian tells him why he did what he did, and Morpheus is a selfish prick. Morpheus agrees that the fault is his for creating him poorly and uncreates him. Morpheus turns his attention to the attendees, and tells them what he thinks. He takes away the dream and joy of being a killer, and replaces it with grief and guilt that they have caused and says they will feel it till the end of time. Let us pause it here for a moment. Morpheus just said to the Corinthian that it is his fault that he created the Corinthian poorly. The serial killers were inspired by the Corinthian. Thus, is it not Morpheus's fault they are what they are? He is punishing and damning them to eternal suffering for a screw-up that he himself has just acknowledged. True, it never should have happened, and Morpheus was imprisoned unable to correct his mistake, but that does not change the fact that these people are the result of his mistake. What repercussions does Morpheus receive? What consequences does he have to endure for making this egregious error? Nothing. Not a fucking thing. All the victims of all of these serial killers caused by his fuck-up are simply swept under the rug. That is a horrible fucking message to convey. We have got to be scraping the bottom of the barrel now. It can't get any worse than this, can it? So Rose and Jed leave. Rose brings Jed up to speed with their family, and Lyta calls saying she is at the hospital in labor. They arrive and she introduces Jed to the flatmates. Rose calls Unity and gets her up to speed. She asks for a favor that if anything happens to her, will she care for Jed? Rose talks to Lyta in her room, and tells her that when she goes to sleep, Morpheus will kill her. Lyta tells her that she is the girl boss. She is in charge and to end this on her terms. That night, Rose goes to sleep. She hops through her flatmate's dreams again, until Morpheus arrives and they are in some snowy tundra. Unity sleeps, and she arrives in the dreaming library. Why? Because the show needs a day ex machina. Lucian arrives, and asks her if Say needs assistance. Unity says she is looking for a book, and the book is what her life would have been had she not been asleep. Lucian says they might not have that book, but Unity is assured they will have it, and of all the books in the library among all of the shelves, she finds it and pulls it out. What else is new? It says Unity Kincaid and Lucian realizes who she is talking to. She tells her she is Rose's great-grandmother, and gives her a grim look. Morpheus tells Rose that death is not a bad thing, and she is welcome to stay in the dreaming if she would like. Gilbert races down to talk to Rose. Morpheus tells Rose, Gilbert is Fiddler's Green. Fiddler's Green offers his life in place of Rose, but Morpheus tells him that is not an option, and the vortex must be destroyed. Rose asks what is the purpose of a vortex then? Morpheus was about to tell her that even he does not know, but Fiddler's Green cuts him off and opines, that dreams exist because humans dream, and not the other way around. That humanity is a miracle, and not a display of power. Let me pause it here for a moment. That is an opinion after all, but in reality, it's more wishful thinking than a theory. If a vortex has already destroyed an entire universe, then clearly vortexes are not just human. If you suggest that because this one is human, and vortexes are naturally occurring, and this is the reason why this vortex was created, then I call it extremely convenient poor writing. And of course, this is not source material. However, I am sure you already knew that on your own. After he delivers his diatribe, Morpheus tells him to assume his place back in the dreaming, and he transforms into a green scenery. Morpheus apologizes in having to do what he has to do, and Rose says she is ready. He raises his hand absorbing her when Lucian and Unity interrupt them. Unity explains that she was meant to be the vortex of this era, much to the confusion of Morpheus. 
Unity tells Rose to reach inside of herself and pull out what is making her the vortex. She tells her to give her her heart. Rose does so and pulls out a glass heart, and gives it to Unity. She says she is now the vortex, and the glass heart breaks. Unity in bed takes her last breath, and Morpheus tells her that she died so Rose can live. Unity is fine with the outcome and says that the father of her baby had gold eyes. That fact interests Morpheus and we see Desire was the father. Unity tells Rose that Mr. Holdaway will take care of everything for her and Jed. How convenient. The person that has not worked a single minute in her life can continue not having to work for the rest of her life. That is life in a work fantasy paradise. Morpheus tells Rose that she has suffered enough, and says his farewell, and Rose wakes up. Rose gets a text of Lita's baby and they go and visit. Jed is annoying as fuck as usual. Ken and Bobby go and visit, and Bobby is pissed off because Ken was banging another woman in his dream. Rose talks to Hal and the spider ladies about their plans and Hal says he is going to move back closer to New York, and Zelda speaks and says they will buy his house. Back in the dreaming, Morpheus goes to Desire's sigil and requests an audience. Morpheus enters the threshold and talks to Desire about unity and the vortex. He asks him why, knowing what he had to do. Since Rose is a descendant of Desire, if Morpheus killed her, he would be guilty of killing a family member. The consequences of killing a member of your own family lineage is death. Morpheus threatens Desire not to interfere with him ever again or else, and Desire blows him off saying until next time. Back in the dreaming, Morpheus is creating new dreams and nightmares when Lucian interrupts him letting him know there is a new book in the library written by Rose Walker. Of course, Lucian likes it, but then again, what else is new? Rose is finishing her manuscript when Lyta calls her for dinner. Not only are her bills all paid for her, but she does not even have to cook for herself. Such privilege. Rose, Jed, Lita and her baby, Hal and Carl, the gay house that should be dead, are now all living together. Okay, we are almost done with the episode. With that said, instead of pouring a bolshy cup of chai, pour yourself a whiskey neat, as we are coming in for a crash landing. Lucian asks if Morpheus is making new nightmares to replace Galt and the Corinthian. Morpheus says he is creating new dreams, and tells Lucian if she wants to say hello to his new dream. The dream turns into Galt with butterfly wings. Lucian says she is beautiful and Galt asks what changed his mind. Morpheus says, he was wrong, as a white male does, as she and Lucian was trying to tell him, but he was too stubborn to listen as Lucian is always right. Yes, my contempt for the show has just shot to the roof. Morpheus says he will be here for a while and asks Lucian to take charge while he is busy, and of course Lucian is now, officially girl boss mode approved. How many times did this show seemingly hit rock bottom? Now, here we are, in the second to last episode, at the end of the second story arc, and I can officially now say that this is the bottom. Merv, Matthew, and even Fiddler's Green, acknowledge Lucian as the true ruler of the dreaming. Not Morpheus on every fucking level imaginable, that is absolutely fucking unacceptable. The title of the show is The Sandman, not Lucian and the Puppet King. Not the girl boss and the impotent white bloke. The show overtly states from Mervyn Matthew that Lucian runs the dreaming better and more efficiently than Morpheus. The show overtly displays Morpheus is inept at ruling his realm having to grovel and ask Lucian for not only assistance, but her wisdom. And finally here, the show overtly states that Morpheus was wrong, and the black women were right. Bunch of fucking nonsense. And finally, the show overtly crowns Lucian in essence to be co-ruler of the dreaming, as the duties are too much for Morpheus to handle on his Odinoki. Sure, Dan. Lastly, we get a post-credit scene of Hell. Lucifer, wearing a red satin bathrobe has an audience with Azazel. It says the lords and generals of Hell demand action against Morpheus. It suggests that since they cannot leave Hell, perhaps they can expand it, but cannot act without Lucifer's wishes she says she will act. Already I can see how the show will fuck up the seasons of Mist story arc. This concludes episode 10 and the Doll's House story arc. Yes, the story arc was rubbish, and it was a slog having to deal with so many insufferable characters. As the insufferable Jed was not in the episode as much as the previous, it seemingly made it a little bit more bearable, however, we still got a heavy dose of insufferable Rose as well as the constantly insufferable Lucian. The final scene with Morpheus Lucian and Galt alone, was enough to qualify the episode as the worst in the show. Let us grade this episode. Without source material, a 3. The resolution is too convenient. Why does Unity dream herself into the library? Of all the times she could have done it, why now, and how? 
it makes no sense and it is a clearly ex machina. With the source material, of course it is a one. If you've seen the movie Conan the Barbarian, you probably know this scene very well. Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and they hear the lamentation of their women. That is good. In this show, we would have to change the dialogue to ask the black woman, let her activate girl boss mode, and kiss her feet in the ground she walks upon for everything she does. Such bullshit. Every time Hollywood tries to make a show like that, it fails to epic proportions. The only thing that mitigates those failures is by tying it to an existing IP using its existing goodwill, but that goodwill will only get you so far, and it will be tarnished in the end. This concludes the review of episode 10. There is one more bonus episode to review, and I will recap my final thoughts on the entire show as well. As always, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next installment. Until then, please like and subscribe, and have a nice day, and take care.